Hello and welcome to Build. We are live from London and today we've got a very special guest in the studio. It's Rick Edwards. Yeah. Hello. If you've got a question for Rick, then don't forget you can put it in the comments below on Facebook or you can tweet us at Build Series LDN. That's Build Series LDN and we'll do our best to get it to Rick before the end of the interview. Rick Edwards. Hello, Dan. Hello, it's very good to see you. We've got a lot to get through. I want to talk to you. Let's about. get stuck in then, Yeah, Daniel. that's absolutely. So, first things first, mm -hmm. second series of Impossible. Yes. Um, so, for those who haven't seen it, it's got a quiz show with a bit of a twist, isn't it? So, what can you tell me about it? Is. I mean, the first thing to say is it's brilliant. That's the first thing. Get that out there. Yeah, yeah. First and foremost. And, and the second thing is, so what we say is that most quiz shows just have right and wrong answers, but we have a third dimension, which is impossible answers. So I'll give you an example. Okay. So, so you get on. So I would say something like, be great if I'd come up with examples before I'm rather than try to think well, <laughs> on the fly, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, okay. This is quite easy. Which European country I'm already out. has... No, I think you'll be, you'll be all right in European country, okay. Dad. You'll come on, mate. <laughs> uh, which European country has the capital Paris? A, France, B, Portugal, or C, Ghana? So the right answer would be... A, that's it. The wrong answer... You in the audience. The wrong answer would be... Ghana. No! no. No, the wrong answer would be Portugal, B. The impossible answer would be Ghana, C, because it's not a European country. It's in Africa, right? So, there we go. Africa You've absolutely knowledge that, out of it. Yeah. So that, that's the concept of the quiz. Okay. If you, if you give an impossible answer, then you get eliminated for the day. What's quite nice about it is that the, the 24 contestants are there for two weeks. So they're there for 10 days, so they get lots of chances, and ultimately they could win £10,000. And that £10,000 obviously is in a, uh, a huge exclamation mark in pound coins, and it kind of comes gushing out when they win. It's pretty exciting. It sounds very dramatic. Oh, it is the highest drama you can get at 2.30 on BBC One. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you about that drama because obviously the stakes are quite high with the mm. cash prizes. Does mm -hmm. that make for quite tense moments when you're filming? Yeah, it does a bit. I mean, there was one, there was one episode where there was a lady called Mao um, who was a very sweet old lady and she'd done quite badly throughout the, uh, the, the quiz. And then on one day, like, towards the end of her two weeks, she got down to the bit where you might be playing for the big money. And she was really, she was like really stressed and nearly on the on the verge of tears because she was so excited she didn't expect it. And then she was just guessing answers, but she guessed them all right and got through to the final. And suddenly, I just found myself like tearing up. Genuinely, I've never I've never teared up on telly before. And I was like, I'm sorry, I think there's a, a sort of dusty in here maybe. <laughs> um, but I just, it really got me, and that, the, and I guess that's because you know it, it is a lot of money, and it could, yeah. you know, it could really sort of, uh, you know, be quite, quite significant to, to someone to win ten thousand pounds. I bloody love it. I, I could do with it as well, actually. Yeah, you, come on the next series if we get one. I, I don't think I would embarrass myself by going on there and getting the wrong answer. To be it's honest, it's good value though. It sounds. It is good. You'd be great value on it, Daniel. <laughs> uh, I'm going to speak to you about it afterwards. <laughs> oh, into it. I'll have the 10,000. Let's go for it. Um, I want to ask you you mentioned the people being on there for quite a long time, the contestants yeah. stick around. Yeah. Do you find yourself getting quite like attached to them when they're there for a, a prolonged period? Absolutely. Like, and, and, you know, you try not to, it's like children, isn't it? You try not to have your favourite contestants, but you do. Um, and one. I guess quite weird thing that's happened is in the first batch of this series, um, there's an old lady, and she wouldn't mind me calling her old because she's 83, um, <laughs> called Shirley, who is sort of my favourite contestant, and I just really liked. She's great. And we're now um, like pen pals. So we just email each other quite a lot. And so I just, I'm just friends with an 83 year old lady. What kind I didn't of see that coming. Did she send you? She's very funny. And it's, it, I mean, it is quite. Um, it's quite pedestrian stuff that she's sending me. It's things like out in the garden doing some weeding today. Some of the plants have got dry. But I still love it. <laughs> like, it's nice, okay. nice getting insight on what's going on in Shirley's life. Uh, and then she'll send me sort of links to things that I might like to buy on Amazon. I mean, it, well, it's, that's really it's, nice. it's eccentric stuff, but I'm enjoying it. It's thoughtful. So that's how, um, yeah, that's how close I get to the contestants. <laughs> Your, um, your personal areas of knowledge are quite spread out, so you must know quite a bit on the show. Is it tough if the contestants are about to say a wrong answer and you maybe know it's wrong? Is it hard to bite your tongue and be like, are you sure? 
Are you sure you want to go with that? Are you sure you want to say that Ghana's in Europe? Well, you have to be quite careful with these things because you can't be seen to be leading the witness. Um, but, I mean, I quite like it when they get stuff wrong. It makes me laugh. <laughs> Particularly when they're, when they're being a bit dumb about it. Yeah. Like, I'm into it. Have you got any specific examples of, like, maybe some of the more outlandish answers, shall we say? It was my favourite, I think, wrong answer was in the first series. And there was this guy... Uh, called Craig, who is a is an actor, um, also on the show. So you sort of assume he maybe isn't doing that well. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and he there was a question about a character in Star Wars, like one of the new Star Wars films. You go through it, blah blah blah. The right answer was this, and then and then he hadn't got it got it right. So there's a question of whether he got it wrong or impossible. And I was chatting to him, and he goes, "Yeah, what's really bad actually." is I was in this film. <laughs> I was like, you were in the film and you've still got it wrong. And he's like, yeah, I just can't remember. I was like, it was only filmed last year, Craig. Yeah, probably near where you were actually filming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of extraordinary. But um, so people have uh, odd gaps in their knowledge about stuff that you would expect them to know. Like, for example, a film they'd been in. Yes, a film that they literally yeah. are in. Yeah. <laughs> That's really unfortunate. It is unfortunate, but it's good telly. It sounds it. I mean, we all love it. I mean, you know, you pretend not to. We all pretend to be above it, but it is fabulous when someone gets something wrong on a quiz show, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> it was all the moments that were screen capping and sending to people, right? Yeah, I don't even bother pretending. <laughs> I'm not enjoying it. <laughs> I just enjoy it. Well, actually, yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, you must be half kind of like, oh, are you sure you want to say that? But also, do you have to kind of stifle laughs a little bit sometimes? Why would I stifle it? I just <laughs> laugh. <laughs> it's quite boastfully point uh, laugh in their faces. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pointing, uh, as we know, is rude. Obviously. Um, but but I, I would laughing, never. Laughing is okay. <laughs> yeah. Is that where you draw the line? Yeah, yeah. I would never point at someone and say, ha, 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 ha. Because I'm a nice person as well. Passionate. Yeah. Clearly. Yeah. Um, compared to other like aspects that you've done in your career, mm. um, Impossible is you dealing with members of the public. Yes. How does that compare to maybe interviewing celebrities and interviewing famous people? Well, I mean, celebrities, uh, as you know, are just people. It's weird when you first realise that. You go, oh, it's still, it's still just a person. Um, but I think that sometimes it's hard to hard to sort of chip away beneath the surface of. Celebrities, you have to work quite hard to get anything out of them. Whereas members of the public tend to be sort of just quite open um, and kind of more fun in that way, I yeah. think. So I, I really like, I really like that stuff. Just but maybe just less inhibited. People. Would you say? Exactly, exactly. I was looking for the word inhibited and I couldn't think of it. So thanks for, thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's me articulate to a T. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the reaction been like from viewers? Because we've seen lately with the chase that game show fans are like surprisingly ride or die. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you had that kind of die-hard reception? There are, there are people yet? who definitely really, really like it. Yeah, I think that it's... Also, because it's on every day, you can sort of become, I think, addicted to these shows. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who just sort of stick their telly on at a certain time and then just stick with it for the whole day and they really love the things that they love. And so you do get a certain amount of... Um, I guess fanaticism, um, but it you know it's very uh, it's very charming. Yeah, we got some fan art the other day. Um, what kind of fan art did you? It get? was uh, so it was a seven year old had drawn a picture of the um, of the exclamation mark filled, uh. with, filled with gold coins. Um, it was terrible, um, <laughs> but the 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 thought that had got into it I really appreciated. I'd also misspelled impossible, and it was like, come on. <laughs> Come on. Nice yeah. constructive criticism for the yeah, yeah. Well, listen, artist there. You've got to send fan art back, sort of annotated and With marked. A red pen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh go. <laughs> Next time, just do it a bit better. Thank you. See me at the end. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to take you back to T4 because that's obviously where a lot of people uh -huh. first got to know you. Do mm. you find a lot of people still ask you about T4 when you're out and about? Do people ask you about that show? Yeah, yeah. People, I mean, quite a lot of the time people sort of still just think that my name is T4. So they'll just go, <laughs> T4! And you go, Rick. Uh, uh, but yeah, I do still get that. But that's quite nice. It's nice to have done something that um, has resonated with people or that people have enjoyed um, when they were hung over at the weekends. Uh, and I kind of, uh, weirdly, I sort of miss it. And I, I miss the, it was a nice 
camaraderie yeah. the other, with the other presenters. And I do still see uh, quite a few of them around. Uh, but it's nice to have a regular sort of hang out with your friends um, and, and introducing friends um, every, every weekend. Yeah, it was good. It was a very kind of like irreverent presenting style. Did mm. you ever have people on for interviews who maybe didn't quite get that sense of humour? Yeah, yeah, we did sometimes. Not not often because I think that, um, y you know, the, the people who bring them in will say, OK, and this show is, you know, it's a bit of fun and blah, 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 and they'll sort of mess around. They might not necessarily ask you about the things you want them to ask you about. Mm -hmm. um, and by and large, they get it. But there were occasions where you'd, you'd sort of, you'd, you'd misjudge it. Um, I misjudged it with Russell Crowe once. That was terrifying. <laughs> with Russell Crowe, famously good sense of humour, Russell Crowe. Yeah, yeah, and I really, yeah, he, um, it, it went down really badly. Also, it was an odd setup where we'd, he was about two and a half hours late. And then when I finally got into the junket room, for some reason, so they, they, they just have these like hotel setups where the, the, the star just sits in a chair and there's a constant sort of conveyor belt of journalists coming in and then they have their five minutes asking the questions and the stars tend to get quite bored. Um, uh, and, and usually you're sort of sitting at this kind of distance, yeah. roughly, like a comfortable distance. And on this occasion, like my knees were basically touching Russell Crowe's knees. So Russell Crowe is here, and I'm a bit like, okay. Uh, and he looks quite angry. I don't know why everything's running late, but it is. And then um, I'd, read, I'd read him complaining that he kept getting asked the same questions on, on every interview, and he was really bored of it. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I said that, I was like, Russell, I know you, you're getting annoyed um, with people asking you the same stuff about your film. And so I would try something, you know, different. Um, if you, and this, this film was the Robin Hood one where he did the accent. And so he was quite antsy about it because his accent was terrible. And, um, uh, and I said, so, uh, and Ridley Scott directed it. I said, would you rather be called uh, Skidly Rot or Russell Crowe? Uh, or Crussell Row, even. That would have been terrible delivery. Uh, and he just sort of, there was a horrible pause, and he just fixed me with his eyes and just went, what's the point of that question? <laughs> I sort of went, no, no, now you ask, I don't know, actually. I was <laughs> trying, to, um, trying to inject some levity, I guess, Russell. And it's, it's failed spectacularly. And now your knees are touching mine, and you hate me. And I've got another seven minutes of this. <laughs> so that, that kind of thing would happen. A uh, similar thing with Jake Gyllenhaal, um, which I don't... I think we won't go into the details of, but I misjudged the question quite badly. Can you give us a taste of what the question was? Just between us, we'll not tell anyone? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So I... And I still... I would say that this is still a good question, actually. Um, so my... To give a bit of context, so my wife is an actress, and I, and I don't like the fact that this means occasionally she has to kiss other boys, which I think is a reasonable thing not to like. And actors always say it doesn't mean anything, it's just acting, it's very mechanical, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I said to Jake Gyllenhaal, with that, and I didn't really explain that part of it, maybe I should have done. Um, I said, okay, what, what about this then, Jake? If uh, there's an amazing role, like your dream role, um, it's the, the thing you're going to get lauded for and you're going to get an Oscar for and you know it's the, it's the role you're born to play. Um, I'm offering you the part. There is one small caveat which has already cast your sister Maggie as the love interest. Do, yes. you, take, do, do you take the role? Um, which I think is a good question because if it is just acting, then why wouldn't you want to make out with your sister on screen? <laughs> and he, I mean... He, uh, I've never seen anyone, even Russell Crowe, look that angry. He was just, he just was like, are you joking? And I was like, uh, no. <laughs> and he just went, no, that's disgusting. <laughs> and I sort of just went, are you sure? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and again, it's that sort of thing where if that had been at the end of the interview, fine, but it was about halfway through. So you just have to soldier on after that. Yeah, you got to. You can't just full well that this person basically wants to punch you. Yes, that's exactly what I knew. Uh -huh. And uh, you have to just soldier on because you can't just go. I'm so sorry. I'll see you later and, and leave because then you you get in trouble with your boss. I mean, to be fair, I think I was in trouble with my boss anyway. Yeah, so it sounds um, like that ship might have already sailed. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a few. Yeah, you have a few hairy moments where you. But I mean, to be fair. It is still a good question. Oh, I, I would stand by it. Defend it yes. to the death. <laughs> yeah. Um, but not in, not in the opinion of Jake Gyllenhaal, crucially.
All right. Well, while we're on the subject of awkward celebrity encounters, can I yes. very quickly touch on safe word? Yes, you can. Yes, you um, can. That must have been good to get back to doing comedy. Yeah, it was. When yeah, you were was, filming that. Yes, it was good. It was good fun. Um, so, so if you don't know, safe word was a kind of formatted celebrity roast show. So you have comedians on, and then you have a couple of uh, celebrity guests, and then they would um, mock them mercilessly. Yeah. Um, and it was it was really good fun, and surprisingly not that hard to book guests because we kind of thought that that you had some good people be. during yeah, yeah we had some terrible people as well but we did have some <laughs> definitely had some some bookings where you're like why is carol vorderman doing this um at money um which pay, paid her uh but like around the world's not going to yeah, pay for itself yeah, now is no, it it's really not um but yeah it was it was a lot of fun to do and there were some moments on that where you sort of thought is David Hay about to punch a comedian. He might be. Um, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. It sort of is, weirdly, it is fingers crossed, but you think, that's great. That'll get some press. Um, and he, he did. It he is awful of, the way your mind goes to that, isn't it? But also, it would get the press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't help yourself. You can't help yourself thinking that. Um, so while yeah. Safe Word was on, mm. you know, you're taking everybody down. Who was a good sport? Who was the best sport? Um, it's sort of the people who I think are quite used to getting ribbed in their day-to-day -day life. So someone like like Joey Essex was amazing on it. Um, well, you probably didn't get half of it. Though. Well, that that obviously helps. Um, but also, he, you know, he's heard most of it before anyway. Mm. Um, Jamie Lang from Made in Chelsea, like he's. He, all he has to do to get roasted is just look on Twitter and like he's getting roasted constantly. So they're, they've kind of got quite a thick skin and they're able to laugh at themselves and, you know, they, um, yeah, they enjoyed it effectively. And that wasn't the case with all, all of the guests, I don't think. Well, I was going to ask you, have you kissed and made up with Sunita yet? Because she was not very impressed with her time on the show, was she? No, no, Sunita... Sunita didn't enjoy herself in the end. And, and this um, is no disrespect to Sunita, who obviously everybody has the utmost respect for, but you mentioned I, people... I, I, weirdly, I don't think I do, actually. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think I might be one of those f weird few people who doesn't have much respect for Sunita. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what, I'm, what I want to say is I would have thought that she, when you mentioned people used to being mm. ribbed, mm. might have been in that camp. And was she not? No, she wasn't, no. Um, she, I think that she hadn't, maybe hadn't had the show explained to her properly beforehand. Mm -hmm. So she's a bit surprised <laughs> how brutal it was. And, uh, and but then the, the weird thing about it was that during the show, she seemed okay. She seemed a bit dazed and like confused, but she didn't. But she wasn't getting gradually wasn't, more angry. No, no, she wasn't getting gradually more angry. And then I think probably in the car on the way home, she's kind of running it through in her head and thinking, well, I've been, I've been really mugged off there, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and she had, uh, and, then, and then she got angry and then she, and then she was tweeting all sorts of horrible stuff about the show, but that's kind of perfect. That's kind of what you- I mean, it was good promo. One, it was good. Was it not? Yeah, really good promo, yeah. So I, I mean, thank you, Sunita. Still no respect for you, but thank you. I mean, I, th I thank Sunita every single day. <laughs> it's the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning. Thank you, Sunita, wherever you are. Yeah. Much as I would be love... a waste of the mural you've got above your yeah, head. Yeah, it's a full-on yeah. shrine. <laughs> Much as I would love to talk to you about Sunita, we are literally 24 hours from a general election. Yes. And in recent years, you've become more and more political. And so mm. I want to um, quickly get your thoughts on all of that. So you wrote um, the book, the None of the Above, yes. years ago. And I want to know how are things different now to how they were when you published that book, politically? Well, uh, I would say a few things have happened, haven't they, in the last couple of years? A fair few, yeah. Uh, it's been a lively time in politics. Um, I still think that the main, so I used to do a show called Free Speech, uh, which is kind of young voters question time. So audience yeah. of young people, politicians, debate. And through doing that, I got very interested in the fact that um, young people don't vote as much as old people. And then looking at the effects of that, which are essentially that um, politicians pay less heed to the needs of young people because by and large, they're looking for votes. And so if they have a choice, are we gonna cut 
you know, something for old people or something for young people to cut something for young people because they, they know that they're not going to the ballot box. And I was kind of perturbed by that. And I think there's some pretty pernicious and terrible things that have, that have happened as a consequence. And so I started trying to work to um, get young people voting. And so that's kind of why I wrote the book. Um, and that really hasn't changed. Although we saw a really a very respectable turnout at the, the, at the referendum. Yeah. Um, still not as many as, as older people. Um, and I suspect that it will be down again um, this time round. Although, that being said, I think that, you know, part of this campaign has really seems to have energised young people. Um, whether that will translate to young people going to the ballot box or not, I don't know. I really hope that it does. Um, but that that's, to me, that's a big, there's a big problem. There's a real sort of uh, inequality there. Um, and I'll continue to try and sort of do what I can to, to address it, I think. Um, you meant, you know, you're a person in the spotlight and you're using your platform for, to, to highlight political issues. Is that something that you feel is a responsibility of yours as somebody who's in the media? I don't know about responsibility. I mean, I can totally understand why um, people wouldn't want to get in, who are sort of have a platform wouldn't want to get involved in politics. Um, I'm not. I'm certainly not someone who would ever want to tell someone how to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, there's plenty of people doing that, so it's a quite crowded marketplace. Yes. Um, that's not for me. I wouldn't really presume to to try and tell anyone, and I wouldn't um, think any less of anyone for voting any particular way. Like I, I get fairly sick of that kind of very polarized stuff that you get on social media yeah. where you know i was just seeing stuff this morning where people are basically saying if you don't vote the way that i'm voting you are well a word that i cannot mm -hmm. repeat um and i think i just can't see how that's helpful i don't i don't i don't like it i just like i i know you know i've got friends who vote for all, all different parties and that's their their right and they come to their their decision how they come to it um so I, I, yeah, that's not that wouldn't be my angle. All, all that I thought was there's a problem with um, political education in this country. I don't think kids, you know, are, are getting enough of it. I don't think there's enough um, sort of clear information out there. Um, and it just occurred to me when I was when I was doing that stuff back before the the 2015 election that oddly someone like me writing a book on politics is maybe more likely to get read by those people than like a seasoned political journalist yeah. because they're like ah oh, the geezer from tall academy um <laughs> and 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 that you know that sort of work like the, the the book did pretty pretty well i think and um and people said it was was helpful and and can kind yeah. of made their help make their mind up about voting at all and then who they were going to vote for and that's sort of all i really wanted to achieve well, that's it, but is it not frustrating for you as someone in the media who's trying to get young people involved to see certain celebrities maybe not use their voice in a way that they could? Yeah. I, I, I guess. I mean, I think something interesting is that before the referendum vote, there were quite a lot of voices out there saying there's no point, like it doesn't really matter. And those same voices at this election are coming round and saying, oh, no, you really should vote. That, that I do find a, sticks in my craw a little bit because ultimately <laughs> the vote in 2016 is a vote for the future, for yeah. generations. And this, I'm not saying it's not a big vote, I'm not saying you shouldn't vote, but there will be another one in five years' time or less. Who knows yeah. these days? Um, the uh, fixed term Parliament Act doesn't seem to apply. Um, so that that I found a bit annoying because I don't really know why you would sort of come out of the woodwork now, or not necessarily even come out of the woodwork now, but having been vocal about there's no point in voting, to then say there is a point in voting yeah. at this election seems, um, I don't know, it just seems a bit perverse to me. Okay, well, we do have some questions from the audience before we wrap up. Got a bit so, heavy there at the end. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Lighten the mood. Who is uh, up first? Hello. Hi, Rick. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm Good. very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, we're loving uh, the podcast Science-ish. Ah, oh, excellent. Yes. And uh, with the general election about to happen, what's the one scientific fact that everybody should know before they vote? Oh, scientific facts before they vote is good. I mean, I suppose I don't know how you'd couch this as a as a as a fact, um, but what we've seen in America 
um, with Trump pulling out of the Paris Agreement, I think it's worth everyone bearing in mind that there is no doubt amongst scientists that climate change, anthropogenic climate change, is a thing and that we do need to act. And I think there's an awful lot of information and kind of skewed uh, stuff out there that suggests otherwise. You know, you, you can you can just go on Twitter and, and find stuff that says, well, no, look, actually, sea ice is increasing. Um, and all of that stuff is very sort of cleverly manipulated. I'm not saying it's sort of entirely uh, false, but it's presented in a, in a way that is misleading. And that, yeah, the truth is climate change is 100% the most important uh, challenge that, that the human race is facing. It's real and we need to act on it. And we do not want to be um, sort of following the lead of, 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 yeah, of, of Trump, essentially. That would be my thing. Good question. Yeah. Who is uh, Always good to get applause for climate change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hotter, hotter. <laughs> Next. Hi, uh, we've got one from Hi. Facebook. Jordan really misses T4 and wants to know what your all-time favourite show was to watch. Oh, yeah, very good. Uh, I was an absolute sucker for Shipwrecked. Um, I really liked Shipwrecked. I thought it was a great show. Uh, quite wanted, so I missed out on going to the island um, to go and film in it, and I was absolutely gutted because um, it, looked, it looked amazing. Um, and, yeah, there was some... Good, honest drama on, on those islands. Yeah, I thought, it was a, I thought it was a great show. That was the best hangover show in the world, Shipwreck. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fabulous. Who is up next? Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, if you had to take one of the Made in Chelsea cast out on a date, who would you pick and why? Oh, horrible scenario. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, easy to cycle through the ones that I don't want to take. Um, I would probably go with Proudlock, um, and I'm sort of, I guess I'm slightly skirting around the issue there. I don't think it'd be a romantic date with Proudlock, um, but I really like him. He's a thoroughly nice, um, hardworking, sort of kind, uh, I think talented man, um, which, and, and none of those descriptions really apply to the others. Um, <laughs> so yeah, probably, probably him, because I, I, like, I actually like him. Well, that did not go as I thought it was going to. And on that... Oh, sorry, I'm on sorry. On that note, <laughs> um, thanks very much, Rick Edwards. Um, that's all we've got time for, so please, one more round of applause. Thank you.